Hi, I'm Greg Keller. I'm Jim Cloud's Chief Product Officer. Welcome to our security briefing, five ways to improve your Wi-Fi security in response to the crack attack. I'm joined here by Scott Reed, who's a senior success engineer. Um, and we're here to talk to you guys about, um, frankly, our remediation plan. Uh, when we saw this attack um, as a security company, we jumped on this. Uh, and we did assemble five specific ways that our company went and looked at all the surfaces that we had to cover. And we wanted to share this with you. We think it's, it's deep data. And again, as a security company, it's stuff we are obligated to share. We all need to ensure that we're protecting each other from the bad guys. All right, let's level set. In order to, uh, to understand the problem that we're in, let's talk about crack. And uh, again, Scott has been brought in uh, because of his tech, technical acumen. Uh, Scott, give us a little run through. What do you know? What do we know about uh, the key retaliation attack? So when I woke up the, the morning of the attack on my Google News feed, I saw the crack vulnerability. And my first approach was to figure out what the heck is going on. So we go online, we, we go to our news sources, and you start to get to the root of the understanding when you figure out that what has been breached is essentially the encryption protocol of wireless. Right. Outside of authentication, outside of how you're accessing the network, you don't have to be on the network. With that being said, as the story continued to grow, what we learned is that there's nothing we as users could do. It all depended on the vendors that our devices were from. Right. So when we think about the fix for crack and what's going to take this crack away, you know, really the having a sanitary attack surface where you're using trusted and known vendors, that's the fix. When we think about how this effect, this attack is going to affect us in the future, really it's going to be these IoT devices that don't receive updates, don't receive patches. But this brings up the conversation of, well, apart from this crack attack, how is your Wi-Fi security posture and what can you do to improve it? All right. So with that being said, you know, we really took an opportunity to dive into Wi-Fi, look at what happened with crack and really see where are we now? What can we do to, to increase our security? And what can we do to make sure that outside of crack, make sure that we don't get breached? Got it. So one quick thing, like when, it, when you really sort of boil it down, um, in effect, the packet can be decrypted and effectively um, the bad guys are jumping in and, and enabling them to basically decrypt passwords and other pieces of information? Exactly. So the way that the attack was, was brought to us and shown to us is there's a YouTube video out that shows the attack in action. Yeah. And what it is, is it's a man in the middle of the attack, but it's just spoofing. It's the idea that there's a wireless broadcasting network that's pretending to be the network you think you're joining, and it has the ability to install a encryption key on your device, which then can read all your traffic. Exactly. And on the endpoint, on the device, that's where this attack is happening. It's not happening on the network, it's happening on the device. I got so it. what we see now is we see the vendors releasing patches, releasing updates. Apple has announced that you know they are not susceptible to the attack, they have patches out, Microsoft also. But the network vendors have had a great response and using current vendors that can deliver their updates over the cloud is really the ways that people can protect the, themselves from these attacks in the future. I got it. Well, it's a good segue. So <clears throat> in the spirit of the, the five things, let's yep. start with number one. We know that um, the first surface are devices, right. and that is a wide range of things. Let's go into a little bit of detail, at least to the extent of what we know. Um, a device is this. Right. A device is our WAPs. Our yep. devices could be quite literally anything. Tell us what you know. So from a device perspective, it's important that any business really use enterprise grade devices. Businesses looking to cut corners and using, you know, you know, maybe wireless access points that they had in their closet or may have gotten at Best Buy, these are not the devices that are going to be able to receive the updates that fix these vulnerabilities when they happen. Mm -hmm. So devices really come down to we need to use, you know, enterprise grade devices and we need to keep the home devices at home. Right. So uh, here's a great example. So my home router, yep. not going to connect to a radio server. Right. Right. <clears throat> so WPA2, um, you know, enterprise or personal. Right. Um, all bets are off. So first recommendation, don't be a cheapskate no. and buy industrial grade stuff. I mean, when it comes to IT, you get what you pay for. And that's always been something that I've learned and actually had to learn the hard way. Right. You get what you pay for. 
So when we think about, you know, to your point, your home router, if you're using a WPA2 passphrase, you didn't need the crack vulnerability to come out for that right. to be cracked. Any person with a Linux box and Kali Linux running can walk outside your house and crack that password. So with that being said, we don't want to bring that into the, the business. We don't want to bring that into the enterprise. And it's very important on the device level that we use, you know, industry standard, you know, really good, real devices. Right. And we'll talk about this a little later, but you know, with respect to uh, Radius, it's outside of the scope of the crack right. epidemic, the crack, you know, exploit. Um, but by all means, your companies, maybe with an exception, which right. is a, a guest network, yep. every employee needs to be uh, authenticating with their own unique uh, individual credentials. You know, obviously just from Security 101, that way you can stop a single person and not have to basically have everyone reset passwords, etc. Individual credentials. We'll talk about Radius in a little bit. But, all right, so devices and getting them patched appropriately. Yep. Um, any resources that a IT admin can go to to basically get a full digest of is my device affected or where can I get help? At this time, the, the resource that I know of is, is Reddit. The, the public you know, networking site has a dedicated subreddit to the crack vulnerability. Okay. And on that, there is a master post where it shows the vendors, it shows if they're patched, if they're not patched, when the patch is coming. So that is where I would go to right now as a source of truth for which devices are affected, got it. which devices are patched. Is that also referencing there's a huge GitHub repo that now has, or at least a wiki, right. um, you know, detailing, it must be probably similar information with right. all of the vendors, the links to their, you know, patches, yep. and or telling you, you know, said vendor does not have, a, you know, a patch at this time. Totally. And when we think about devices that we're probably not thinking of, internet connected fridge. This vulnerability will probably exist in every internet connected fridge <laughs> until the end of time. Right. These devices are things that are in our homes that, yeah, they're not going to be sending credit card data or traffic, but they're going to be vulnerabilities that exist. So Internet of Things devices are something that we need to think about. You know, oftentimes the issue with these devices is that they're plug and play pieces of different vendors' parts. Yeah. So a firmware patch that might have to fix the Wi-Fi might not even be from the vendor who you bought the device from. That's right. So that's why these vulnerabilities are going to exist and be in the wild, and we've got to think about them. Right. So let's wrap up before we move to the second point. Get your uh, devices <coughs> patched, yep. but throw out the ones that are in industrial grade. Make yeah. sure that they can, WPA2 will, will be fixed, yep. but make sure that they can be appropriately authenticated, typically through a radius service. Right. Okay. Devices done. Second point, public Wi-Fi. I mean, uh, I, I think the first thing that I learned four years ago when I, I joined GemCloud um, was... Um, don't use the airport Wi-Fi ever, 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 ever. And from then on, I've always used you know my tethered yep. you know, wireless access point, my hotspot for my phone. Um, that way, I can at least, to the extent that I trust my my carrier, yep. um, that it is a protected singular singular thread of my information out to right. you know, the, the quote public internet. What do we need to know or what do our folks need to know about uh, public Wi-Fi? When your only option is public Wi-Fi, that's a great time to do things like clean up your computer, clean up the folders and files. Do not join public Wi-Fi. There is no reason to. You put yourself into an attack surface that you can't define. And the idea is, is you're joining a network not of your peers, but of anyone. And anyone on that network has the ability to communicate with your computer. Right. So what is nice is oftentimes being the nerd that I am, when I'm on public Wi-Fi, not doing anything you know to, that, that could potentially be caught up, I'll try and figure out what the Wi-Fi vendors are. I'll try to figure out what subnet I'm on. And when I can determine that I'm on an isolated subnet where no one else is there, DIA, for example, uses Meraki Wi-Fi. Yes. I know this because I, I've, I've done the research when I was there. At that point, you know, with some certainty you can say, I'm on my own subnet, there's no other devices here, let me do what I need to do. But public Wi-Fi being, if you stay at a, at a hotel that may be you know, a bed and breakfast, not a name brand, we want to stay off those networks. And we want to use that opportunity to clean up our computers, reorganize your files, clean out your downloads, free up space. That's the IT admin talking in me. I know that not everyone's going to do that, Brian, but that is my take on public Wi-Fi. Good. You got it. Don't use it. Hate to say it. Tell your mom to. Don't use it. The bad guys don't need to hack her bank account. Okay, let's move now in from in the spirit of public Wi-Fi into the general internet and right. services, specifically um, websites or web services 
um, that aren't utilizing HTTPS. I mean, go to jumpcloud.com, right. HTTPS. I mean, obviously, uh, security company. Um, what do we need to know? What do our, our viewers need to know? So to me, that, that that's a question that sets me up to say, when I spoke about using enterprise grade you know, hardware, use enterprise grade software. This is when we need to be using the Chromes, the Firefoxes, the Safaris. These off browsers aren't going to alert you to the fact that you're on an unprotected connection. The nice thing about using a Chrome and a Safari and a Firefox, they're gonna let you know when your, your connection's insecure. So you don't have the choice of, is it gonna be HTTPS? Right. But if you get a prompt that says, this site that you're on is not, stay away from that site. I can't think of a vendor in today's IT space that will be providing things apart from maybe you know some old phone vendors that are still using legacy software that'll be an HTTP connection within the network. But even those I would stay away from because these are attack services that you're opening up to your endpoint. And if you're connected to your company's network, your company's network. Yeah, that's right. All right, so that's point three. Um, if, if you have the opportunity, um, you should vote by not uh, utilizing an HTTP site, yep. go you know select your vendors uh, or apply scrutiny over your selection criteria. Um, don't don't bring on a service, a web service that isn't using a secure protocol uh, through HTTP. Yep. Okay. So in the spirit of security and and networking, let's talk a little bit about uh, leveraging existing VPNs. Right. Um, so any guidance, any counsel that we want to give to our viewers? So a VPN or a virtual private network is essentially making you anonymous on the local network that you're on. You're not sending your traffic in the form that it is to their network, you're sending it to your VPN provider. Often we, we receive VPNs from our companies so that we can connect to network resources. But this is also a way to, in, to secure ourselves when we're on other networks. That being said, when we're connected to a VPN, all of your network traffic is being pushed to the provider of that VPN. If it's your company, then anything you're doing, if you're streaming Netflix, you're essentially streaming it on their network. So we need to be mindful about when and where we use a VPN. Would I recommend using a VPN to you know, get my work done when I'm on a network that I know is secure? No. Would I recommend using a VPN when let's say I'm in another country and I need to access you know, my network and I want to per perhaps use you know, the, the US Google that I'm used to? Yes. On a side note, we can also think of non-company VPNs are things we can do in our personal lives on the other side where you can buy subscriptions to VPNs and use these in a similar way to you know, secure yourself on networks without passing your traffic to your employer. Mm -hmm. This is a way that I think about using VPNs for security. Um, with that being said, we need to vet these VPNs so do not go for these, you know, free VPN subscription for life models. You know, there are true trusted VPN providers out there. And who are who would you use? Um, Not that we're condoning, but I'm just, you know, in the spirit of... Um, I mean, if, if it was my choice, I would stand up my own... Uh, I would stand up my own firewall on Amazon, right. configure that to be my VPN, hopefully with some free licensing I used, and then I was in yeah. complete control. Yes. That's going to be difficult to teach my mom how to do that. Yes, that would be. <laughs> And so we talked a little bit about, you know, radius. Um, obviously, we're bullish on this fact. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, the concept of, uh, of sharing credentials um, has gone by the way of the dodo, as far as I'm concerned. Yep. Um, in a, in, you know, for those that have a progressive security posture, you and I both know, because we witness it, uh, every day with new prospects coming in saying we need to stop sharing our credentials. Yeah. How can you help us? And of course, you know, from a wireless perspective or a VPN perspective, right. Radius is going to be the solution. So you enter. Obviously, you know, we're instrumented here with Radius through and through. Right. Um, every employee that's bolted into this company on day one has provided their Jump Cloud account, yep. access to the Wi-Fi, their MacBook, etc. So our viewers generally know that. Um, what's your take, though? What's your guidance on getting folks comfortable and familiar with utilizing Radius as a service? So when we think about our roles as IT admins, it is to protect the company from their blind spots. If there is a shared password out there that provides access to your corporate <laughs> network, that is the largest blind spot you can essentially have. You mean your only job wasn't changing employee passwords? No, in fact, it wasn't. What? <laughs> now... Where we are now is the biggest barrier to entry to employing something was Radius was, well, I have to stand up a server. I have to maintain the server. I have to keep the lights on. If my server goes down, my network goes down. 
One of the reasons I came to Jump Cloud is because I said, whoa, you mean I can use Radius and I don't need a server? I can just you know, let you guys handle that? Radius in its simplest form takes you from a one-to-many situation between your network and access to it, where many people can access with one password, to a one-to-one -one relationship. Where when you start, like you said on my first day, I got my credentials to my computer, my email, and the Wi-Fi, and guess what? They're all the same, they're all mine. That's the glory of what we think of as taking away blind spots. When I leave, which you know, who knows? I hope I never do. Let's, let's ride this into the sunset. <laughs> You can simply revoke my, my password, and now I can't access my computer, I can't access my email, oh, and I can't access the network. Mm -hmm. That in its simplest form is why Radius is so powerful, and to come full circle, in order to implement Radius, we need to use industry-proven you know, enterprise equipment. We cannot be bringing in, into the environment you know, access points that don't support it, because these are blind spots that I don't think a company can recover from. That's right. Awesome. I mean, just hearing you and your experience obviously speaks for itself. Um, folks, that's it. Uh, those are effectively the five things that we wanted to talk to you about. Again, it was our swap plan. We had some of the stuff in place already, um, but uh, really the core that you know we've just finished through was ensuring that our employees and our own Jump Cloud equipment is updated, patched to sort of squash this vulnerability. Um, in, in addition to this video, this is sort of a, a spoken narrative that Scott and I wanted to do, but you'll see accompanying blog posts and other material um, that we want to share and give to uh, just the general public on how to protect yourselves against uh, this crack exploit. Thanks again for joining. Uh, again, Scott Reed, Senior Success Engineer, and I'm Greg Keller, uh, the, uh, the Chief Product Officer with Jump Cloud. Thanks for joining.